lie. What's going on peeps? This is Jay Pooch coming at you with an all new video. Now this isn't three rounds with Jay. Do not worry. That is still coming out every Friday. This is an all new video. This is an all new kind of show. What this show is, for those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, this is Jay at the movies. What I'll be doing each week, I'll be watching a film, whether it be a recent release in theaters or something that just came out on Blu-ray and DVD and digital online. In this case, I'm talking about a film that came out October 2nd on Blu-ray and DVD, and that is Sicario 2, Day of the Sub Battle. This is the sequel to the smash hit Sicario. The film that stars Emily Blunt, Josh Brolin, and last but not least, the incredible Benicio Del Toro, who absolutely kills it in the first Sicario. He is the man to watch and the man you kind of wish you want to be in a sick little sense. This guy, he embodies a true villain. And sense the f in the sense that at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, he kills an entire family, including the two children and the wife. That is something uncalled for and something you do not see in the base period. Oof, horrible start right there. But that's something you don't see in cinema ever really. So what's Sicario 2 about? Why do we need a sequel to this film? Well, to be quite honest, we didn't need a sequel to this film. We did not need one at all, especially with the film we just got. If your plan was to have three movies out of this one, my goodness, did you make a mistake. Right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that this is not a fun movie. This is a fun movie if you just like my mindless action with a story that's all over the place. And what do I mean by that? Let me calm down a bit because I'm getting a little amped up with how disappointed I was with this film. See, Sicario 2 takes basically the idea of Spider-Man 3. We take everything and we throw it all out the window and hope it sticks. Well, it doesn't stick. I'm sorry to tell you, this film kind of felt like a mess. In the simple sense that we've got four, if not at least three stories moving at the same time. Here, let's break this down quick. The United States of America is under attack by terrorists. The terrorists happen to have crossed over the border from Mexico into America. Him and his pals blow up a, uh, a convenience store, killing over hundreds of people. Basically picture Costco but smaller and they just happen to blow it up, killing uh, some unfortunate citizens and basically a disgusting act of terror. The Americans response to this is, let's go to war with the Mexicans because now you've broken our treaty, you've broken our our agreement that we were going to be friendly with one another. You basically just allowed someone to cross over and, to, to, and to, to do some harm and damage to our people. So the response to this basically is, let's go to war with them. But let's go to war with them in a way where they do not know that it was us that led them to that point. They want to start a war with all the cartels to basically destroy Mexico from the inside out. Plans and goals. The plan doesn't go as planned, basically. Let's, let's summarize that. But how did they plan on pulling this off? Quite simple. Let's attack the man who was responsible behind murdering Benicio Del Toro's family. And how do we do this? We incorporate Benicio Del Toro. We hire Josh Brolin to come back with his band of hooligans and to bring back Benicio Del Toro with him in a plan. And a plan so simple that you almost wish that the film was basically about this plan. The plan is to kidnap the drug lord's daughter. Hold her kidnapped until it's time to let her go or basically just cut her loose. The reason for doing so is because now as the drug lord is searching for his daughter, the other individuals, the other drug dealers, the other cartels are also out there looking for the daughter. Because they're looking for the daughter because they want to kill her. They want to kidnap her, kill her, do whatever they want in order to get to the kingpin. That's basically what the goal of the film is, is to get the kingpin pen, pin's attention and to cause havoc in Mexico. Now how do you pull off this elaborate plan? Simple. You abduct the girl as she's in school. You abduct the girl as she's in school, you bring her to a safe house and you set up a raid. You basically convince this girl, who has not seen any of the faces of the individuals who, who have kidnapped her, you convince her now that the United States government has saved her from the other cartels that are after to kill her. And while you're saving her, and the other cartels are killing one another, and the big boss is looking for her, you expect to see the big boss in the film at some point. You expect to see this, this Reyes character, you expect to see the, the King Ping and the Drug Lord appear at some point in this movie. You never do. You never hear a peep from him. 
It doesn't even appear once in this film. I don't even know where he was throughout the film. It's not even mentioned where he was. Now you see, that's where you lost me. The film could have been as simple, as simple as that, and it could have worked. And it could have been as simple as the first Sicario. Because you see, what the first Sicario did right is it played with your emotions. It played with your patience, and it made you wait, and it made you sit on the edge of your seat, anticipating and, and waiting for something to occur. Picture that scene from the first Sicario film where they're waiting at the Mexican border and they're waiting to cross and they're sitting in the car you got Emily Blunt, you got James, Josh Brolin and you got Benicio Del Toro all having a conversation and Benicio's telling you that this is unlike anything that you've ever experienced in your life as you cross the border remember that sequence and remember how long it lingered and lingered and lingered and you're seeing out the outside window as people are passing them by, passing them by. you see him through the other car the, the other characters that are sitting in their vehicles and they're, and they're looking around and wondering what's going on because there are people passing their, these cars by and getting into position to attack. You remember all of this and you're waiting and you're waiting and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and now we're at war and now there's some shots being fired, people are getting killed. You see the anticipation is what made that scene in that film so great. What this film basically does is it takes all that anticipation away and it just goes for broke. It goes straight for the jugular and straight to the action. It forgets what, what, what's its, what it, and it, at the end of the day, what it, in its essence, what it was about. It was about making a film with a simple idea and making it original, making it fun, making you care for the characters. You see, by the end of that movie, you cared for Emily Blunt. You cared for Josh Brolin. You cared for Benicio Del Toro. That is why there's a sequel that was made. Because we cared so much for these characters that we wanted to see them come back. We wanted to see them tell a different story. Now in the case of the sequel, Emily Blunt does not appear in this film. I do not believe she's even mentioned once. And her replacement is a small little child that happens to be kidnapped. The drug dealer's daughter, basically. Now she, this girl, rather than having the, the appeal that Emily Blunt had, where you cared for her character and you got to see the world through her eyes and experience everything as she was experiencing it. In this film, you're basically tossed into a world where this girl is the drug dealer's daughter. She basically walks around with a chip on her shoulder because she knows she can get away with anything because her father will back her up. The film will basically, the film opens up, well the film doesn't open up, but her opening scene is her basically punching another girl in the face. She's in a fight. She gets sent to the principal's office, acts like a smartass, and then is suddenly kidnapped. So now how am I supposed to technically care for this character? You basically had her act like an ass, and now you've got her kidnapped, and now you're dragging it along and making me, making, and trying to make me have a connection with her because I'm supposed to care that there's a chance that she may die, that all these people are after her. But we don't, because she does not present any morals. She does not present any real emotion as to why we should care. And I'm not, and I'm not uh, berating this little girl and her performance. She does fantastic with what she's given. By the end of the movie, you almost wish, you, you want her to live. You want her to go on and live a life. You don't want her to end up in the same position where her father is as a kingpin. You want her to have something better with her life. So as this film is unfolding, it really comes down to as this film is unfolding, and I told you what the plan is, is to kidnap this girl, start a war with Mexico. There is a secondary storyline that is going on, and that is about this young character who has now been brought into the life of smuggling Mexicans across the border into America. His buddy or cousin has invited him to be a part to make extra money, which is usually how it starts off. So let's make some extra money, it's easy work, all you gotta do is you gotta take this group of people and bring them into America. So this is the one storyline, this is the secondary storyline that is going on. The third storyline now, that is undergoing, because there are multiple things that are going on, occurs after a basically botched situation where the Americans are trying to now bring the daughter across the border into the States. They are, uh, while doing so, they, happen, they are attacked by the Mexican police. The Mexican police are under the payroll, obviously, of some drug cartels. Which cartels? It's never really explored because it seems like the writers don't really care and they leave a lot of plot holes in this film. So once this attack goes down and the United States Army 
basically clears out all the Mexican police. We're now presented with a problem, with a problem where now the Mexican government is aware of America's presence in Mexico. What happens when America is, is, is basically found out? Well, the Americans try to cut ties. They say, listen, this was not part of the plan. They now know you killed Mexican officials. The government is involved. We got to cut her loose. We got to basically kill her and have no connection to anything that has occurred. Here's where the problem presents itself, and here's where a fourth story appears. Josh Brolin is faced with the task of contacting Benicio del Toro and informing him that now I've got to, you've got to kill this girl. You've got to kill this girl or else. Or else, we come after you. What do you think happens? Benicio del Toro says he cannot do it. He simply cannot do it because this little girl reminds him of the daughter he once had. A daughter that was killed. Twist here. A daughter that was killed by this girl's father. The father had a hit put out on Benicio del Toro, the accountant, and basically wiped out his entire family. So, so throughout this film, a connection, a bond is basically formed between Benicio and the daughter. They get so close that Benicio feels like almost like a father figure towards her and he can't let her go and he wants to help her get back to America and get her into a safe house and get her to somewhere safe where she won't be found and she won't be harmed. Throughout this whole situation, as they're trying to cross the border, they happen to go to, guess where, the people who are smuggling cutters across the border. Now, what happens in this situation is that during the film, there is a moment where Benicio del Toro, Josh Brolin, and a third character are in a vehicle at a mall, and they happen to almost run over the character I told you about, the nephew, uh, the cousin, I mean, the young cousin. And the young cousin eyes Benicio del Toro. He sees him with the officers, and right off the bat, while sitting at the bus station, Benicio del Toro is spotted, and the cousin is informed that he believes that Benicio del Toro is a narc. He is a police officer. He is there to put an end to the reign of smuggling those across the border. But in reality, all Benicio is trying to do is trying to get back to the United States of America with this little girl. As this happens, the little girl is revealed to the smugglers that she happens to actually be the daughter of the kingpin, of the drug lord. So you see how there's multiple things going on at once. Now, I don't want to give away what happens once he's found out. I don't want to give away what happens at the end of this film. If you're interested in watching it, I do suggest you should check it out. But personally, if it's if you don't have two hours in your day, and if it's something you didn't really like in the first film, you probably won't like the second film. Because the first film was far superior to what this film offers over here. What the second film tries to do is it tries to take the incredible action of the first one, minus the anticipation, and just ramps it up by a thousand. Not only that, the lot, this film is basically a Spanish lesson for those of you who don't speak Spanish. A lot of the dialogue is spoken in Spanish. Yes, there are subtitles, so for those who are not a fan of reading, this may not be something fun for you. There is also about a 10 minute sequence of just uh, sign language, where there once again are subtitles to explain the sign language that is being shown on the screen. So if you're not a fan of reading, and if you're not a fan of basically a film that this, the majority of it doesn't take place in English and it's a foreign language film, then this is not the film for you. But if you're open-minded and want to take a look at what's going on, I do suggest giving it a chance. I do suggest giving it at least one watch. That's what it's worth at this point. If you love the first one, go ahead and check out the second one. But I, I can't promise you'll enjoy it. I left disappointed. If I had to review this app, I had to review this. If I had to give this a rating, I would honestly say that this is probably a 5.5 .5 on 10. I don't want to give it any lower, lower because there were some parts that I did like, but there were more parts that I did not. There was a lot about this film that I felt as if it was just lazy writing. Almost as lazy as this review was. And I know I'm knocking myself, like I said, this is the first one. We're going to get this right. A little nervous, but we're going to get this right. So, at least I have all the chances in the world and I didn't spend millions of dollars to get this right. In their case, they have one chance. They presented you a sequel. They presented you a sequel that many people wanted. They basically wanted to see a film about Benicio Del Toro's character. And they gave us that. They gave us basically half of that almost. And when I say half of that, I mean that happens at the end when Benicio Del Toro makes an appearance to this young individual that happened to have eyed him and spotted him and ratted him out. And basically under the assumption that he is a narc that got him in trouble. When he makes an appearance full suited 
and ask the guy, so you want to be a Sicario? That's how the film ends, and that's basically how the, this film should have been. It should have been a story about a hitman teaching another hitman, your basic hitman story where you teach someone else how to go about things, and all well, hell breaks loose. But it should have been done in a way where the anticipation, as, it, as there was in the first one, was still there, was still a part of it. Instead, this film leaves it all on the cutting room floor and just sticks to basic mindless action and it's just and, and, and feels like a cash grab. I hate to say it, but this does feel like a cash grab. This is basically a slap in the face to those who love the first one. It's like, hey, you guys love the first one. You're not getting that. This is going to be something completely different. If they do make a third film, I really do hope that they change something up because this didn't work for it. This film didn't it didn't do anything for the franchise or series or whatever this is going to be considered. I don't want to don't want to harp on the director. He did his best with the source material he had. Tyler Sheridan, who I believe was the writer of this film, I did expect more from him. He's done a lot of films. He's done some quite incredible films that I've personally enjoyed. But this was just quite honestly not one of them. At the end of the day, if you got two hours that you just want to waste for mindless action, go ahead and check it out. But if you don't have any time for this, and it wasn't on your list to begin with, it's not really worth it. That's all for today. That was my review. That was Jay at the Movies. If you liked what you heard, if you felt that it was a bit weak this, this episode, I apologize. It's the first one. Give us a shot. Subscribe, like, share to your friends. I will be back next week. I will be better next week. We'll have some surprises for next week. I'll see you next Thursday. Like always, peace, be safe. And I'll see you all around.